cute little rustula and it looks like it could be a court, Cortinarius. Uh, Phaeolus schweinitzii. We have some Ganoderma aplanatum, Satharella aquatica. Hypomyces lactiflorum aranaceus. Yeah, I've never seen one around oh here. Oh my gosh, I never see aranaceus. It's always Coralodes herbiatus. Oh, that smell. That's phenomenal. Hey, welcome to another episode of Mushroom Wonderland. And uh, today I have a special guest from Oregon and we're gonna go on a, a little bit of a hike. Uh, this is a mycologist from Eugene, Oregon, uh, Sydney over Singleton, am I saying that right? Yep. Okay, he goes by Sydney OS sometimes and if you're on Facebook or in the identification forums, you might be familiar with his name. Oh, how did you get your start in mycology? I really just wanted to know what the mushrooms in my area were because I was seeing them everywhere didn't know too much about them at the time, so I just sort of did a deep dive on fungi, starting with ID, just so I actually knew what I was looking at. How um, old were you when you started? I think at that point I was 16. Okay. Um, and uh, so I had kind of gotten into ID, and then uh, about the time there was the Spring Undergraduate Research Symposium at LCC while I was an undergrad. What's LCC? Lane Community College. Oh, okay, Lane Community College in yeah. Eugene, Oregon. Uh huh. Okay. Um, great place. They have like this nice property out back. But uh, right around the time they were doing that symposium is when I got into culturing fungi. When I realized you could pretty easily manipulate their mycelium, get them on the scope, and see what they were doing at a deeper level. So I kind of took the opportunity to apply those and I started this paper towel waste uh, micro-remediation project for my undergraduate cool. research project um, just to deal with the brown paper towel waste. For the newer people, micro-remediation is, is using... Fungi more or less to solve man-made problems, usually in the context of some form of pollution or contamination, you know, micro-remediation of heavy metals, of things like plastic waste or various waste streams so basically you're taking oyster mushrooms and eating they're eating the trash yeah right so breaking down garbage that's a really simple way to put it so i uh currently um i'm no longer at lcc um but i work at u of o in the schofield lab which is a high energy physics lab that studies leaf cutter ants and currently scorpions as well um for material properties but i work in there with the uh, symbiotic fungus that leafcutter ants cultivate. Um, or you could say that the fungus cultivates the ants, depending on your perspective. How about some more basic questions? Do you like eating mushrooms? I do. Yeah, what's your favorite mushroom to eat? Ooh, that's a difficult one. Um, probably my favorite meal with mushrooms is a uh, matsutake and Amanita muscaria hot and sour soup with Ooh. detoxed Amanita muscaria. And the matsutake are my favorite component. Okay. Um, it involves pretty much any mushroom I have in my fridge at the time, but the matsutake really tie it all together. Yeah. So I would say probably matsutake. They're also cool. probably one of my favorites to hunt. I like too. how you say matsutake. There was a guy on the channel like giving me a hard time because I say matsutake. And he's like, in Japan they say matsutake. He was on my case about it. So there you go, dude, if you're watching. <laughs> uh, I love matsutake. That was kind of like my introduction. My grandma taught me to pick mushrooms as a little kid. And she was taught by her grandma who was from Japan. Mm. And so it was all about like, if you ever come across the matsutake. She passed away before I ever found my first. But still, it's got to be like maybe the most exciting mushrooms for me to find. Mm -hmm. What about you? Like, if you're out in the forest and you come across a mushroom, what do you think is going to excite you the most? That's also another, that's a really difficult question. I'd say it, like, kind of depends on what I'm out there for. Let's say uh, edible mushrooms. Edible mushrooms. Um, it might actually be sporasis, the cauliflower mushrooms. Oh, yeah, mushrooms, I love it. Just because, you know, there's areas where they're, you know relatively frequent but it's not exactly like chanterelles where you can visit an area and consistently find them it'll be like just at the base of one tree right for like an acre 
Yeah. Um, the hunting for those goes a lot differently, and it's pretty much always an incidental find exactly. when I'm out there. It's yeah. like you'll be surprised suddenly with more mushroom than you can carry home. To cut or to pluck? Ah. To cut or pluck? What, what do you say about that? Well, you know, talking about mycelium again, really for the vast majority of species, I'd say there might be some exceptions. Um, you're really not going to be harming the mycelium, which is generally many orders of magnitude larger than the mushroom you're taking underneath or in the log or substrate. Um, you pulling or cutting that mushroom is really not going to affect it. Um, the mycelium has already spent its nutrients producing that mushroom and for most species we collect too, by the time you pull them, they've already released a lot of spores and they're releasing spores as you carry them through the woods on your way out. Many have argued that humans do a better job of dispersal than some mushrooms would have sitting wherever they are. We're gonna get walking into the woods down here and go see what kind of cool mushrooms we could find and just try to milk more information out of Sydney. So thanks for joining Mushroom Wonderland and uh, let's head into the forest. Yeah. Uh, Phaeolus schweinitzii. Um, Dyer's polypore or uh, also affectionately called butt rot. Um, it'll often cause like a mixed root rot and heart rot of the trees it parasitizes. Chances are it actually killed this tree and it uh, snapped because of a brown heart rot. Um, it'll usually continue to fruit long after they're dead so it's sort of like a you might say parasitoid and then it'll infect a live tree. Um, but it doesn't really care if the host dies. <laughs> oh, so it kills trees. Huh? It kills trees. It's um, probably one of the biggest killers of like middle and old growth trees. Um, it takes decades, decades and decades, but you'll often see it eating the roots of very old uh, dug fir. Um, spruce too, it loves to eat spruce in our area. Cool. Uh, you can see like a great spore deposit down here. Um, these spores can actually stay dormant for like a very long time in soil and continue to infect the roots of trees that are nearby. Some countries have very strict regulations on this species because it's such a, a big pest. Um, I love this species though. It has very interesting pigments, um, commonly used by dyers, like mushroom dyers. Um, it gives a, a fluorescent dye too. That's probably my favorite use for it, as you can do like kind of a invisible black light pigment. Cool. Yeah. So this spot, they, they come back every year for the past several years. It's just still feeding on this one dead snag here, you think, huh? Um, it actually looks like right here is last year's fruiting body, yeah. Fruit body. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is almost definitely associated with this, this dead tree here. Although it might be eating the roots of the surrounding trees at this point too. So when I, I've when somebody posts one of these and they go, "With well, this beautiful mushroom growing in my lawn," does that mean your tree is dead? It means your tree is slowly dying. Yeah. Um, for smaller trees, uh, if it's only causing a heart rot, doesn't necessarily mean a death sentence. It makes them more susceptible to snapping in wind. Um, the butt rot, though, is very deadly. It'll, it'll uh, basically ring the roots of the tree with sort of a mixed brown rot, and uh, it'll uproot and fall over. You'll okay. see, like, these snapped roots on, uh, like, older trees that fall over, and you can actually, like, find soft spots where the faolas has weakened it. Oh, wow. um, if I see this species around Eugene, where there's, like, kind of a mid-sized dug fir, like, right next to somebody's house, and there's faolas on it, as soon as you start to see crown death, you know that the root rot's advanced enough where, like I'll, I'll go in their yard and first I'll ask them like, can I pick it? Um, I'll also tell them they should probably have an arborist come out and check the tree to make sure it's not gonna fall on their house anytime soon. Good call. And why do you pick it? Uh, dying. So um, you dye fabric with mushrooms, yeah? Yeah, and actually the, um, the fluorescent stain, which is uh, the compound is a mix of hispidin and hispidin derivatives, um, it can actually be used for fluorescence microscopy as well. Cool. It's just a really nice generalized protein stain. So you can light 
most fungal tissues up. You can light human tissues up under the scope. Um, and uh, the black light reactive henna is probably my favorite use. You can do these invisible designs on skin that only show up under a UV light. It's a lot of fun. Awesome. And so this week you're going up to do the international, what is it? International Fungi and Fiber Symposium um, in Port Townsend. And uh, actually, I'm going to be teaching a few classes there, all focused on the fluorescent applications of this mushroom. So I have one entire course set up where the entire class will be using, uh, I call it like mushroom henna where you'll basically be drawing fluorescent designs on skin and then uh, you wash it off and there's no mark under normal light, but under black light you'll get these beautiful neon green designs. No oh, way. Wow. Yeah. Now, cute little rustula and like it could be a court, Cortinarius. A Cortinarius and a Rusula. They're buddies. Thankfully, it does look like there's actually a good amount of moisture in the soil here. Um, I am not particularly amazing at Rusula or Cortinarius ID, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but they're pretty common at the start of the season. The Cortinarius are just insanely diverse. Um, Nobody at this point that I know in person has started using all the new names yet, but they did recently get split into new genera. Tons uh, of it, huh? By section, so like Dermosibi, Leprosibe, etc. Um, Some people are angry. A lot of people are angry. <laughs> you know, similar thing happened with uh, Inicide too. Um, we got like Inosperma now and all these different groups that I'm, I was already bad with and aside to begin with and now I'm never going to be able to keep it straight. This is a waxy cap, right? Yep. Um, really, uh, a lot of them like to grow in uh, cedar, cedar needles or cedar scales. Um, it's also one of the few groups that are really diverse in uh, redwood forests too. Um, not many species will actually consume those and so they have a lot of diversity in that niche. Um, you'll see them in grasslands too. Um, you know, Jack and, uh, Jack Johnson really, really likes these. And they're a sapro, saprobe, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, although I think they have a few other odd roles, maybe doing like end of fight stuff with grasses. Um, that's one thing they're, they're looking at. This November we're hoping to get cultures of some going. There's a little Ramiria, yeah, a little coral. Yeah, a little coral. It's got great color and it hasn't dried out. Which is a good sign. I've heard a lot of people go, oh, Grandpa used to eat those and, you know, whatever. And then I've also, I have a friend who personally ate some that was, he was sure that they were the good ones and he ended up on the toilet for two days. It's so. all over the place, really. I mean, I've heard a number of different rules, like all spring corals are edible, all fall corals are toxic. Um, some people will say... Are those true? It's all over the place. One yeah. of the things I've heard too is that uh, among the fall species, um, if they have clear jelly in the base on a cross section versus totally solid. Um, however, I've heard people say that the jelly means they're edible and I've heard people say the jelly means they're toxic. So I've, you'll hear about people doing <laughs> both and not getting sick or vice versa and getting sick. So might be an, an individual thing. I'm yeah. kind of inclined to, to think that it's an individual sensitivity sort of thing or maybe related to the way they're cooked. Um, I'm kind of inclined to say that all corals are probably edible for some people and uh, some people probably just can't tolerate many of them. Um, so far as I know, there's not really any species that's distinctly associated with always causing GI problems. Um, within this group though, thankfully, the worst you're looking at is just GI upset. No deadly ones. No deadly ones. Good. Rustula brava peas, it looks like. Mm. Got that nice white spore print, uh, and this one's actually already kind of broken. Yeah. Um, these are edible. Not many people eat them. 
they're probably most well known as being the host for the parasite Hypomyces lactifluorum, um, which will infect these and turn them into lobster mushrooms. Um, the exact life cycle there is actually still not fully elucidated, um, but funnily enough, uh, David Aurora, actually uh, a pretty well-known West Coast mycologist, uh, he actually conducted a blind taste test where he had people try lobsters and the uninfected brevipes side by side, and people couldn't tell the difference. It might be that we like lobsters because they're easier to identify and humans like to eat brightly colored things. Um, That's a genius little study. That's cool. Yeah, I know. He, cool. he loves doing those blind taste tests. Um, I also read his quote in the book, Mushrooms Demystified, that this is the most boring mushroom in the forest. We have some Ganoderma aplanatum, um, a somewhat common and very aggressive decomposer, usually of hardwoods. Um, you'll often see it eating every available log near a creek or river. Um, they're extremely prolific spore producers. I don't know how well it shows up, but you can see this dusting of brown that has just covered this entire area. Um, even though their spores are kind of hard to germinate, they managed to get enough out there to be a huge primary decomposer in forest ecosystems. They play a very important role in wood breakdown um, and uh, contain many of the same medicinal compounds actually as uh, some of the other Ganoderma that people call Reishi. Sometimes they'll do this banding pattern. Um, each band doesn't necessarily represent a year, it more represents a, a growth spurt. Um, so they'll throw new layers onto the edge. And um, these ones are kind of doing it both directions, but you can see how this one, instead of going outwards, is more throwing layers on downwards. Eventually you can come out with like sort of a stack of pancakes morphology. Um, where you have all the bands on top of each other, which is very similar to how a garicon will grow in the wild. Um, people mix them up. Uh, the prolific brown spores and the staining of the pore surface will help rule those out, though. You can tell them apart pretty easily. Sometimes people mix these up with uh, Fomatopsis, too. Um, another really common primary decay, conch. And, uh, that one has a white pore surface too, but it will not stain brown when you scratch it. Um, gotcha. And it does not have these prolific brown spores either. So we're near this little stream and it made me think like, do you guys have an aquatic mushroom that grows in Oregon, huh? Yeah, um, in the uh, Rogue River in Oregon, um, there was actually a discovery, ooh, I think maybe two or three decades ago, something like that, um, of a mushroom, an actual stem and cap agaric-shaped mushroom growing underwater in the middle of the river. Um, sometimes you'll see this when a fruiting log happens to be suddenly submerged in a flood or when they're growing in like grass that gets flooded. But this was a truly aquatic mushroom. It was actually coming from wood that had been long buried underwater. Uh, it was named Satharella aquatica. Uh, and so far it's only been documented from this one stretch of the uh, Rogue River. Um, there's a few aquatic mushrooms that are Ascomycetes. Um, you'll get these like tiny little cups or stocked things um, but this is the so far as i know the only documented gilled mushroom that you'll find in water and it's worth looking out for because we don't have many documentation like there's very little observations on this species habitat is basically just submerged smaller sticks kind of half buried in the sediment and so much of oregon and the pacific northwest has that potential um, I think the only reason it hasn't been observed more is because you need a snorkel. <laughs> it 
And so earlier we found the unparasitized Rustula brevipes, and here we have a definitely on the older side, um, Hypomyces lactifluorum, uh, more commonly known as the lobster mushroom. So this red layer is the spore bearing fertile portion. Um, it's kind of hard to see without a little loop. Um, the entire surface is pocked with uh, parathekia, these little urns full of spores that get ejected. Uh, and underneath that is all this kind of semi-digested host tissue. Um, sometimes on a cross section, you'll actually be able to see the half digested gills of the russula underneath, um, which uh, is pretty much completely broken down by the time they get to this stage. Interestingly, we still don't know very much about the actual phenology of the infection as to when a healthy russula gets infected how it progresses over time. Um, from start to finish, in terms of what these spores do, like where they go, do they parasitize the mycelium of the rustula before, like before it ever even produces a fruit body? Do they infect young, tiny primordia of the rustula and then it grows up into a lobster? Or do they show up and attack mostly developed, partially mature rustula and convert them into a lobster? Um, Based on the behavior of other Hypomyces species, there's a, a bunch you can find. Um, the other super common one is the Chrysospermus, Microspermus, uh, Bolete Eater. Um, based on their habits and life cycles, I'm inclined to think that they show up and attack already partially mature Russula. However, there's certainly possible uh, possibilities that it's actually associated with or infecting the mycelium beforehand. Really, we need more research on these. For, for how widespread and eaten they are, we have a lot of gaps in our understanding of this species. Um, I mostly use them as a dye mushroom, though. Um, you don't care for eating them? I'm not the biggest fan. Like, I'll eat them, but I find I get a lot more out of the dye. Um, it's just such a versatile, potent dye mushroom. You'll get uh, the... Um, the pigment, Skyrin, is yellow at an acidic low pH, uh, orange at a neutral pH, and then as you go higher and higher into the alkaline range, you'll get a red, like a really nice red similar to this at about 8.5, and then past that you'll get these like grape or raspberry purples. So really it's a, a dye mushroom that'll give four potent colors and I find it to be one of my favorite dyers because those are just all phenomenal colors to use. Um, Is a nasty old rotten one full of millipedes still good for dyeing? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Funnily enough with lobsters, the older the better. Um, when, you're, when it comes to dyeing at least. Um, this, uh, this skin, you know, if you kind of break this open, you'll be able to see the inside where the russula flesh is doesn't really contain any pigment. So when you're dying with them, you really will peel off this outer skyrim rich portion. And uh, that's what gets used for dying. And the older the lobster is, the more that is loaded up with pigment. So it's nasty, but really the longer you wait on lobsters, the better for dying. Um, some people will even pick food grade lobsters and let them decay before peeling them for dying. Wow. Um, but you just made some people mad out there. Probably. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, mm. I, I, you know, I found them just dark purple. Mm -hmm. Those are good ones, yeah. Yeah, okay. during breakdown, you'll get an alkaline pH that'll start to shift it like inside too. Cool. cool. Yeah, and these are really, can be tricky to see. I, I saw the spores before I even saw the mushroom. I could see a little plume of white on the ground. So are those the spores of the Hypomyces lactiflorum or are those yeah. the spores of the Russula brevipes? They're the spores of the Hypomyces. So you can see... Spindle shaped under a microscope, yeah? Yeah, kind of like crescenty spindle shaped, sometimes slightly curved, really interesting. Sometimes with some oil droplets, but um, kind of just scattered on a lot of these is a, a mixture of Russula mycelium and then spores from the Hypomyces. They're super prolific spore producers. Um, a lot of people get really confused and concerned after picking them because uh, they'd be like, oh, my lobsters went moldy overnight. They all turned white and dusty. And that's just the spores of the Hypomyces that coat them. Sometimes it'll almost look like frost. 
It's okay uh, to eat that. Yeah, totally okay. okay. It rinses right off, or you can just toss it all in the pan. Sometimes there'll be, you know, the host, Rustula, is often mostly buried. And in this case, it just kind of looked like a disturbance in the duff with some white peeking out. Mm -hmm. And then you have to do a little digging to actually reveal the lobster itself. Maybe can, we'll find another one and show oh, yeah. how, how tricky they can be to yeah, see. I They're probably that. all around us, honestly. Uh-huh. I bet if we look around, we'll find some. And we can. It is interesting with the uh, idea that maybe the mycelium is parasitized, but I recently found a lobster just within arm's reach of an unparasitized host, yeah. Rusula. So it made me think, well, if it was the mycelium, this is probably coming from the same mycelium, right. that why wouldn't this one be parasitized exactly. as well? Exactly, and also you can find intermediates. You can find Rusula that are only half digested, half converted. Um, sometimes you'll find tiny little primordia that have been lobsterized, and at the point they're fully orange and coated with the fertile surface, they definitely are no longer growing. The rustula is gone at that point. Mm. Um, I definitely fall into the camp that it infects pretty much already developed mushrooms, pretty much well-developed rustula. Um, but other hypomyces do associate with mycelium sometimes, so it's a little hard to say. What would be really cool is to replicate each step of the life cycle. Unfortunately, Rustula and lobsters in situ, undisturbed, are super seasonal. You'd have to do a ton of legwork to make sure you caught all the participants mm. at the right stage. And their mycorrhizal to add to Yeah, to you, add. They, you wouldn't be able to cultivate them. It, you'd have to find them in the field, more or less. Wow. Interesting, but so much more to learn, which is always exciting. Yeah, you know. uh, it's, it's pretty wild. You know, mycology is a young field and even super iconic well-known and picked mushrooms still have huge areas of research that nobody's ever gone down. Wow, look at this, coming out of the tree. It looks like hyphaloma. Oh yeah, yeah, a little fasciculare. Oh, I wish I brought my UV light with me. That is so cute. I they're, almost brought mine. Yeah. They're coming out of all the little holes here. Just little clusters of primordia. So this is going to be a beautiful yeah, flush in a month. This... We're gonna, I'm going to come back and get some pictures. Look at this big dead snag widow maker here. I'm amazed this hasn't snapped yet. <laughs> yeah, the first windstorm. This is a dangerous mine. tree for sure. For sure. Especially but... with these eating it from the bottom. When I first started picking mushrooms, chanterelles were definitely like the ones I was looking for and they seemed so elusive, they seemed so hard to find. And now they just uh, like seem so common right. to me. I think you get better uh, with experience. I think you get better at Absolutely. picking and yeah. seeing mushroom shapes in the wild. I think you build up also kind of this like subconscious idea or kind of a gestalt of what the right habitat looks like and you'll kind of, consciously, subconsciously seek that out. Um, you know, there's so much positive reinforcement whenever you successfully find a mushroom you're looking for. I think your brain kind of screenshots everything in the area when that happens. And so over time, you'll really develop this kind of like sixth sense for like, you look up a hillside and be like, yeah, right there, right there is where the chanterelles are gonna be. Yep. And the lobsters, etc. Oh wow, that is a chunk. Whoa! Dang, that is still eating quality for sure. And I just about walked right past this huh? crack here. It looks like we might have another one. Um, Woo! Let's that see that is big a boy. Big in. Oh yeah. yeah, there's a smaller one next to it too. This is a great example. Um, you know. I love just seeing how the cap and stem of the host is just completely gone at this point. Totally turned into this just smooth surface. And uh, you can see here these spore spores have built up where the soil didn't allow them to disperse into the air. Um, smacking lobsters usually will give you a good idea of uh, how intact they are. Um, 
when they start to rot they'll definitely hollow out a little bit this one feels nice and firm it's this great orangey color rather than like sort of the reddish or purplish spots they'll get as they age um, that is a, a really nice specimen how would you cook that um, really my favorite when I am eating lobsters instead of dying with them I'll uh, usually just do like kind of home fry style chunks like little cubes and um, I'll prep them almost like home fries just like really simple seasoning garlic butter etc um, they hold their texture really well when they're fried so you can do these uh, really really nice glazes on them um, and their texture really is different from a lot of other species you know they're um, the the host russula um, on a microscopic level their tissue is actually made up of uh, joined spheres almost kind of a foam rather than the fibrous meteor textures that you see in other mushrooms like oysters and that's the same reason why they they snap when you break them almost like chalk you know they don't break along threads like chicken would and uh, that texture is captured here it gives them almost a crunch like mm -hmm. not necessarily from the crisping during cooking but they have a real nice bite to them um, and when they're on the older side they definitely get a bit of a seafoody flavor too some people really like that See oh, one of those growing here? That's Aranaceus. Yeah, I've never seen one around oh, here. Oh my gosh, I never see Aranaceus. It's always Coroloides or Beatus. Um, wow, so what do we find here? Oh, it's fresh. Um, so this is actually uh, Heresium Aranaceus. Uh, the common name is Lion's Mane Mushroom. And uh, this is one that's extensively cultivated. Um, it works as both a, many people use it as a medicinal mushroom or edible. Um, it has a really good texture, and this one is amazingly fresh, too. Like, this is a, we have Heresium in the Pacific Northwest, but uh, by far, many more degrees common are the coral tooth or bear's head tooth, um, Heresium coralloides on uh, hardwoods, and Heresium abiatus on softwood conifer. So it's, it's really, really uncommon to see Aranaceus out here. Usually you'll see them like 10 feet up growing from like a little hole in a maple or an oak. Um, this is probably a really old maple log. Um, it's definitely hardwood, which you can also guess from the Ganoderma aplanatum that's coming off it further down. Certainly worth checking this whole log in case there's more fruit bodies of the Heresium. Wow. Um, when you find isolates, when you find specimens like this, uh, I highly recommend cloning them. There's a large demand for local Heresium strains. Um, most of the Aranaceus strains on the market for cultivation uh, are not from the Pacific Northwest because it's uncommon here. And uh, a lot of ours perform very well in cultivation. But this, uh, you know, these Heresium are unique in that they have these long spines, these soft tooth projections uh, to bear their spores. Um, you know, gills are more common in the Basidiomycetes, and the entire idea is to maximize surface area. So these have taken a different route with spines or long hanging teeth that are covered in spore bearing Basidia instead of gills or gills or uh, pores. Um, but that is just a phenomenal specimen. I, you do not see these often, not at all. I would go so far as to say it's rare. These are actually foliota. Um, oh gosh, what's the name species? Squarosa? Something along those lines, yeah. It's got the uh, darker little ornaments instead of white, which would be like something along the lines of adiposa group. Um, these are fun. Uh, if you get them under UV, the cystidia on the edges of the gills will glow super bright. You can actually get it under the microscope too. Um, some of these are edible, but they are known to cause GI upset somewhat more commonly. It actually looks almost like there's a clean knife cut here where somebody might have taken. Oh, yeah. <laughs> taken those. More Look mature at... hyphaloma here. These have a really cool texture. Very cool wavy caps. I yeah. never usually see that. 
Um, you can see the uh, purple black spores building up on the caps like here. Um, and these are very fluorescent. Under black light they grow they glow bright, bright neon green, green yellow. It's super impressive. You'll be able to spot them from like 30 feet away. Cluster a high philoma fasciculare. Oh, I wish it were night. Clusters like that just they glow up so amazing under black light. This is a pretty classic shape. Um, so these are one of the Ganoderma, kind of more commonly known as a reishi mushroom. Um, sort of before I pick it, um, this is probably Ganoderma organets, and uh, this will be easily differentiated from the more common Aplanatum, which produces the same color as spores, um, because. Two, two key traits. Um, it tends to develop this stipe. Um, it'll sort of stand off the surface it's on. It's not necessarily always there, which is why you look for the second trait. Um, it's a little covered up on this one because of all the spores, but if you look, you'll see it has this reddish, reddish, orangish, brownish, sort of lacquered appearance. Um, Anywhere the spores aren't covering it up, you can see really like how glossy it is down here. Um, and interestingly enough, this is actually a lacquer too. Um, it is hardened, hardened resin. Um, hmm. Over time, you can crack it, and uh, the browning that you see when you scratch the base. Um, it might be better for this. Um, the same browning you see on the pore surface of uh, aplanatum is actually resin leaking out and hardening on the surface, which are often gathered for their medicinal benefits. Um, the main components are uh, triterpene, triterpenes, um, or uh, what is it? Uh, it's a class of uh, sesquiterpenes and um, really a lot of different benefits, you know, the volume of research published on these is insane to the point where you really have to start judging which ones are thoroughly unbiased. Um, but people say anti-inflammatory, anti-tumor, um, antioxidant, really a million and one benefits. It's a very, probably one of the most popular edible or medicinal mushrooms out there. Um, always fun to find. And it pretty much shares much of the habitat with Aplanatum on these long fallen logs, except you tend to see them on conifer instead of hardwood, at least in our region. We also have, a, oh, it's either sessile or curtesii that you'll see at the base of like cottonwood sometimes, but our most common reishi are definitely the organets. Um, beautiful mushrooms. These are really nice specimens too. Just like classic, all down this log, you see two huge ones down there. And then these littler ones just dotting, each surrounded by their cloud of brown spores. They seem to grow back on the same log every year. I imagine yeah. that's probably going to happen until they eat everything they can out of it, yeah? Pretty much. Are they a brown rot decayer like yeah. a Fomitopsis? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, wait. I believe so. Um... <laughs> the bark is still here. Um, I believe on conifer... These are a brown rot, but then the Ganoderma aplanatum on hardwoods is a white rot. Oh, so interesting. So, hmm. I'm actually not 100%. It's a white rot. White rot decayer, okay. Yeah, it's a white rot. So it leaves the white wood behind instead of the brown, yeah. like um, the foamy topsis. White, really soft, fibrous, and then you can actually see the mycelium going through this too, but uh, my foot started sinking into the log here, so I just reached down to see which it was. And what's right below your foot here? That is Fomatopsis. Um, we kind of got split. We used to call them all Fomatopsis pinicola or Pinae canadensis. We now have two, um, Mounciae and Ocracia. 
Um, this is probably the latter. It has a much less classically brackety appearance. It'll come down in these almost like hoof-like shapes. Um, tends not to be as brightly red at the edge. Um, a lot of people still lump them together just into panicola because they don't want to remember the new names. But uh, <laughs> also some people treat these as a similar medicinal to the Ganoderma, making teas and such. I'm not a big fan of the flavor. Um, they do contain a lot of oxalic acid though, so I'd be cautious about drinking too much or eating too much. Very cool fruiting of them here oh, though. Oh yeah, I, these I, are some really nice specimens. Very beautiful. And uh, these can easily be differentiated from the Ganoderma because they have a non-staining pore surface. So you won't be able to draw on them like you can with the Ganoderma. This is a really nice hillside. So what do you see here? Like I was saying, I, I discovered this several years ago. I sent an email to Paul Stamets with a picture of this. And he said that he was very curious about it. He sent mm -hmm. out some guys from um, Fungi Perfecti. And on the bottom of the fertile surface, this was white. It was only this big. Mm -hmm. And you could see the sample where they took a core sample out of it. Yeah. And I thought it had died. I was honestly, like, upset. And then I came back, and it continues to grow. Huh. But it's strange looking, right? It, looks, uh... it definitely looks strange. Um, I don't know. It's a little darker. The texture's a little less graded, um, but uh, agaricon definitely comes in a bunch of different growth forms. Um, sometimes it's that classic tiered appearance where you'll get layer after layer after layer until you get almost this sort of honeycomb-esque thing. So this might be early on in that process. Um, it would certainly be a very weird Fomatopsis if it was a Fomatopsis. Right. Um, but a lot of these polypores have indeterminate growth. You can see that indeterminate growth where both of the new layers have actually enveloped it. So this is now incorporated into the fruit body running diagonally. It's bizarre. Um, yeah, sometimes they'll grow fast enough that you'll even see like blades of grass or more herbaceous plants closed into them. It's crazy. Um, but definitely part of the reason Paul would send a team out to investigate a Garricon is uh, they're basically cataloging occurrences and deliberately taking samples so that they can create a genetic database of different strains. Um, they, they have kind of a conservation mindset about it because at some points it's been called rare. Um, they're also interested in the actually pretty potently antiviral properties that it has in vitro. Um, and so they're really just collecting a lot of material to work with. But it's also, an a if it is Fomatopsis, it's also an atypical Fomatopsis with this tiered growth. Um, typically, you'd expect a bit more of like this vertical texture and almost not really tomentose, but sort of raggedy, fibrous edge with lines. Um, but On a Garricon. Yeah, but when mm -hmm. they start off too, you know, that first layer, when it gets put out, they can look a lot like Fomatopsis. Um, the super distinct tiered appearance often doesn't show up until they have a lot of layers down. Um, but, yeah. We got this beautiful gutation all over the bottom. These little droplets. Sort of comparable to fungal sweat or urine. It's uh, little droplets of metabolites that get exuded even on a dry day. So it's not just dew or raindrops. Um, some of them have interesting tastes which is kind of cool. <laughs> Some are sweet or spicy or bitter or sour. All right. Um, so I'm not the only one who runs around licking wild mushrooms. No, no. <laughs> cool, so that concludes our walk with Sydney. That was actually really productive we found a lot of mushrooms yeah for the dryness we found some great things and that Arenaceus was a really really cool find that was that was a highlight for me for sure me too so i hope you got some value out of that video make sure you hit subscribe and like the videos and leave a positive comment and uh check in the future for more videos hopefully with sydney and uh and we'll see you uh, next time much love everybody